he is the president of our company and, and he is much involved and has been with the company since 2000 and is very much involved with the Timberland. And um, it's something I did not know that anything about before I joined Landas, but have found the whole thing absolutely amazing. And in, the, in our current times right now with what's going on with toilet paper and uh, building material and all of that, I just thought this would be a really interesting topic for us, uh, for Joe to speak to us about uh, Timberland and how it affects our lives uh, during this time and frankly, all the time. And uh, also investment opportunities within Timberland, but outside of that, how Timberland um, actually um, affects our other investments too, like in Home Depot or Amazon or whatever. So, um, and so Joe is going to discuss the current state of Timberland right now. So I give it to Joe. Good. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so uh, log up the screen here. And as Catherine said, um, uh, I uh, work on the, the corporate side of Landvest. I came up on the Timberland side, which is my particular expertise. Uh, though Landvest, as the leader in integrated real estate and Timberland management, uh, we're all expected to know something about uh, the other side of the business uh, and also allows us to uh, dive deeper into more complex assets, especially when you have an intersection of both. Uh, timberland, real property, and uh, luxury residential. So I've called this uh, Toilet Paper to Amazon Prime, uh, how COVID-19 is affecting timberland investments, uh, paper and forest product sectors. Um, this was something that, uh, not this presentation, but on, on one of our uh, team calls recently, I, I uh, rattled off some of, of these statistics at, at a very high level, and, and Catherine felt like it's it's something that would be interesting for um, others to hear. So I'll, I'll focus on that. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, sorry, my little window's covering my slide. Um, there we go. So why would, you know, you listen to us, uh, Landvest, although many of you probably know us from our residential uh, practice, uh, the timber side of Landvest is the largest broker of institutional timberlands in the United States. We control about one third of that market um, across the US. Uh, it's about a $2 billion annual space. We do about 700 to 750 million uh, in annual sales. Uh, we're the second largest third party manager of timberland in the US with two and a half million acres uh, of timberland under management. So those are properties that are owned by uh, institutional owners, high net worth families, um, uh, and even nonprofits. And we're providing the day to day management of tending to and harvesting the trees. Uh, we're involved in the entire United States, uh, every investment region, which are generally considered uh, the Western US. Uh, the Lake States, the Northeast, and, and then the Southern Pine Belt uh, from East Texas into Virginia. And then the integration of our timberlands, real estate consulting, and residential space give us uh, a unique depth and, and breadth to the market. Um, we have a number of clients who have four luxury properties and own 20 or 30 or 100,000 or a million acres of timberland somewhere in the United States. And so it allows us to offer more comprehensive management of that real property portfolio. Next slide, Caitlin. All right, so why do you care? Uh, the first statement is pretty straightforward one that COVID-19 has disrupted the way we live. It's disrupted the way we spend money. It's messed with supply chains, uh, industrial operations, uh, and almost everything that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. As you all have heard in a number of sectors, some of these will be temporary uh, and some of them are impacts which will change the way that we spend money, live uh, and uh, operate our supply chains uh, for some time to come. Forest products uh, it represents a wide array of, of commodity and industrial goods, uh, some of which you'd be intimately familiar with and some of which are surprising. Uh, one of the biggest is just the land component that oftentimes when you build houses or uh, commercial facilities, industrial, 
Uh, that is going on forest land or timber land representing a conversion uh, to a higher and better use from forestry. Housing, we build houses out of trees. Oftentimes there are masonry products and that sort of thing, but there is uh, a lumber or panel product that goes into almost every uh, home. Energy, uh, there's a large intersection of energy, uh, whether it be home heating fuels, uh, pellets, or the manufacturing facilities themselves that gasify their waste products and generate electricity with it. There's packaging that we're going to talk more about. There are chemicals uh, that go into glues and resins. There's food products, emulsifiers, uh, industrial products, cigarette papers, uh, sponges, biodegradable sponges are made out of cellulose fiber. So all these different things uh, that uh, impact the, the paper and forest products. So uh, when we change the way that we live uh, and the way that we spend money, uh, we change the supply and demand uh, um, around these products and you know, also the price signals that they send. Go ahead, Caitlin. All right, so before we go on, you need to get a little primer on forestry. This is about as straightforward as we can give it. On the left side, you see a softwood tree, what we also call the pointy top trees. They don't lose their leaves in the fall, okay? And on the right side, we've got hardwood trees, also called the round top trees. This particular one is displaying its fall foliage a little early uh, here for the spring. Um, but those are your two basic kinds. And you can see that we've segmented the tree where the top part, smaller part, uh, less valuable part is generally referred to as pulpwood, okay? Uh, and then the bottom part, uh, the larger part, the stem of the tree, um, that goes into higher valued uh, saw log products. Those are generally um, solid material products, either lumber or they may be made into panel um, or some sort of industrial matting project. All right, so that's all you need to know about forestry. Next one, Caitlin. Uh, okay, best one for the fire pit. Uh, can we get all the hit questions if they're fast? Ones like this. Hardwood is always better. It's got less creosote. Uh, and you want to have one with a high BTU content that cools well, such as oak uh, or maple. All right. So what are markets doing? Uh, you know, we talked about the fact that there are a lot of products that come from trees. And the top of the tree, you remember, generally goes into pulp, paper, and packaging. Uh, and I've thrown up some examples here, and we're going to talk about what they do. So the first one is everybody's favorite, toilet paper, fake news, okay? They're not making more toilet paper. I know that everybody's telling you that they're increasing capacity and making more toilet paper. That's not the case. The manufacturers know that COVID-19 does not cause you to use more toilet paper, okay? Um, when we look at any of these products, as again, we said in the beginning of the slide, we think about how COVID-19 has impacted the way that we live, the things that we're utilizing, the way that we spend money, and it's not causing use to use more toilet paper. So the manufacturers uh, are continuing to make the same amount of toilet paper that they always have. Uh, they're sending news signals out saying, we're operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They always did that. They run three shifts of eight, 24 hours a day, because it's very expensive to idle the plant or shut it down. And they're really making the same. They understand that the consumer has just shifted uh, where the supply is in the chain from the manufacturer or the warehouse or the retail environment into their hoarding COVID stockpile in their cabinets. And come August, you're not going to be buying more toilet paper. You're going to um, um, be taking it out of the closet. And yes, Albany, Georgia, South Georgia, and Coastal Georgia are two of the largest uh, tissue manufacturing regions. All right. Alternatively, we've got liner board. Okay, liner board is made out of softwood or pointy top trees. Okay. Uh, it is that brown paper that you see. So brown paper lines cardboard boxes on the outside and inside. It's run through a corrugator and uh, used to make the little corrugated insides of a box. Uh, it's used for paper bags, right? So think about how your day-to-day -day lives are. You're getting more things shipped to your house, Amazon Prime, right? 
Uh, when you go to the grocery store, they're not allowing you to bring your reusable bag. They're requiring that you use their paper bag or plastic bag, as the case is sometimes. We hate plastic bags. Um, so there's another weird thing in liner board that's really disrupted the supply chain, uh, and that is the fact that there's no more recycling, okay? Uh, when you go to the recycling center or the dump, everything's going into the compactor. It's being burned or landfilled, and that's because they don't want you lingering around the recycling bin. So uh, a lot of liner board is made out of a product we called OCC, that's old corrugated container. And because there's not recycled material going into the product, there's less material to make the liner board out of. So we have uh, a supply imbalance with an increase in demand. So that's putting upward pressure on liner board. Uncoated free sheet, that's white cut paper, largest consumer of white cut paper. This comes out of the round top trees, all right? Generally hardwood trees. Largest consumer of round uses for of cut paper are offices and schools, okay? So I don't see anyone in their office right now and I don't think that many kids are going to school. So that's a loser in this equation. And then you've got specialty packaging and pulp uh, think about frozen foods. Uh, think about the specialty pulps that go into cigarette papers, uh, cigarette filters. Think about personal protective equipment, gowns, masks. These are made of cellulose fibers, okay? So we're definitely eating more packaged, material, packaged foods because we're not going to restaurants. Uh, we're obviously our medical providers are, are using more personal protective equipment and um, you know, people are smoking more, as studies indicate, all right? Uh, on the lumber and solid wood side, you've got dimensional lumber. So this is what we're cutting out of the base of the tree. Um, so that's usually, you know, two by sixes, two by eights, big beams, things that you build houses with, okay? Housing starts are off uh, by about 40% since January because builders weren't allowed to get in there and build houses. And also obviously with the contraction in the economy due to the large unemployment. So dimension number lot doing well. Panel and plywood, you know, what we sheet houses with, what we make floors out of, what we put on top of our roofs. Uh, again, not building houses, not doing well. Stud lumber, alternatively, this is basically like an eight foot two by four, the smaller material that you'd find at your home center. Uh, there's been an increase in demand for that product uh, because so many people are at home, they're doing remodel projects, uh, doing improvements. So we've seen actually a shortage uh, at the retail level and there've been a lot of pressure uh, put on that. And then also the other home improvement, you know, box store items, fencing, decking, treated materials. Um, these are, you know, as people sit at home and think about, oh, I, I've got to fix the fence. I've always wanted that new deck. Uh, we've seen a lot of upward pressure and pricing on those or at least stability. All right, next one, Caitlin. So who are the winners and losers? Um, you know, there are winners and losers for both the owners of Timberland and manufacturers. Speaking, you know, the best case scenario, if you had a softwood property that was going into liner board products that was close to a mill, you would be doing very well. If you had uh, redwood, you would be doing reasonably well in or cedar cutting into the decking market. Uh, really anything other than Douglas fir on the dimension uh, scale uh, is doing fairly well. Douglas fir is the prime species for California and Washington, which have specific, are very large markets and have specific building codes relative to kiln dried Douglas fir because of the earthquake risk. Um, if you had uh, a heavy exposure to cut paper, that's idled. Um, we see cut paper has decreased production by about 30% in the last six weeks. Uh, dimension lumber is off about 25%, okay? That's actually very good. It's been helpful for the market because it has regulated it a fair amount. Uh, this is an industry, the lumber industry, even in good times or normal times, is highly cyclical and highly variable. And so it's in a manufacturing capacity that is very responsive to the price signals that the market sends and buildups in the supply chain. So we've seen that capacity come offline and that has stabilized uh, lumber values. Um, right now they've, they've, they bottomed about 25% below their 
uh, peak of a year ago, and they've come up about, uh, they've made up about a quarter of that. Uh, so they're off about 18%, we'll say, all right? Final note to know, though, is you just can't harvest some of the tree, okay? Uh, when we showed the graphic of the softwood tree and the hardwood tree, the reality is those grow in the forest together. And if you are going to operate a stand, you have to cut the whole tree, meaning take the saw log and the pulpwood, and oftentimes you have to be taking hardwood and softwood. So this has had to, uh, you know, it's affected some people more than others. If you had a heavier hardwood stand, you wouldn't operate it right now. If you had a heavy softwood stand, you probably would operate that. Uh, it shifted uh, areas of where harvesting is being happened, and then also the volumes or the treatments that you might have in those stands. You may opt to just thin a forest right now instead of uh, clear cut it so that you could target uh, the species that in demand. But as always with timberland, uh, if markets aren't good, you just let the trees sit and they grow 5%. So when you have a vacancy in timberland and markets aren't good, your investment's still growing. Joe, uh, can I ask you a question on that topic? Yeah. Like how, how, how fast and easy is it to start and stop the process? Because if she papers off 30% and demand is down, um, like how, how, like what's the, what's the production timeline? Like how far back are we going to be backlogged in terms of like harvesting, cutting, manufacturing, like going through the manufacturing process? Like how is easy is it to start and stop it? At, at the manufacturing level, it's pretty easy, okay? Um, so uh, right now, a uh, liner board is operating at about 96 to 98% of capacity, what they call capacity. And they could really scale back to about 75 to 70% and go up to 105% just by tailoring the number of shifts that they do or what they're putting through on the green end. Um, you know, normally they're dealing with a 30 to 60 day inventory in the supply chain. So it's not like they've got a year's worth of inventory uh, that you know they have to work through uh, to, to start it or stop it. The other thing that, that happens, Craig, is that uh, it's typically every manufacturing plant, especially sawmills, but also pulp and paper manufacturers, take two to three weeks off uh, during the 4th of July, typically. Uh, it's a period that you know works well for vacation. It's the summertime uh, and um, uh, it's also fire season in some areas, so it's just a good time to not be operating both in the woods and, and in the mills. And that's when they do their, um, uh, their, manu their maintenance. Uh, so what we're seeing right now is that many of the manufacturers have just announced, we're taking two weeks off uh, for 4th of July early, and we will open up again. We'll, we'll do CapEx and maintenance projects during that time, and we'll open that back up again. Uh, so, you know, they'll shut down the mill, or else they'll operate it at only 75% with two shifts. Gotcha, thank you, that's helpful. So this is Laurel Lynn, what, um, when you have this type of an investment, and maybe you'll talk about this, how do you hedge? Like how do you, what's the offset of, uh, of an investment like this? Or is this, or, or is this a portfolio in and of itself and there's nothing else? Yeah, it's a great question. So there are a number of different hedging strategies and, and depending on, on how large of a portfolio you build or how esoteric you want to get with those, um, you know, at, at, at the, the sort of multi-billion dollar, multi-billion dollar, or hundred million dollar level, uh, you may have investments overseas as well as domestic in different currencies and that sort of thing. Uh, if you were just talking about a five million dollar investment uh, in the United States, or $3 million investment, we'll say, you'd buy a million dollars worth of property in the Pacific Northwest, a million dollars worth of property in the Southern US, and a million dollars worth of property in the Northeast. And then you, you know, have coverage. I mean, even in normal times, you can have a fire at a mill, right? Uh, or you can have uh, a hurricane that shuts things down. Uh, or you could just have, you know, the, the normal cyclical nature of, of the industry where Plywood's doing well, but uh, saw timber isn't. So if you have multiple species and multiple products that are being delivered into multiple manufacturing centers in different geographic 
geographic regions, then you that's typically the way that you would accomplish both a, a market hedging strategy as well as the risk of forest fire or insect or hurricane or drought or global warming, climate change, any of those. Okay, so I think uh, now we will uh, move on to our next topic. Um, for people who came in late, I'm Amy Corcoran. I'm the director of New England for Bonhams Auctioneers. And um, I am going to toss it over to Amy Thompson, who is our uh, international business development person for post-war and contemporary art. Um, and Amy worked in our London office. She's now based in Chicago, but she works with our, our team uh, around the globe. So she's going to uh, give you sort of an update on that market, which I would say is kind of the, the pinnacle of uh, sort of the passion investment. So take it away, Amy. So I'll say for the millionth time in the last two months, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, could you go ahead to the next slide, Caitlin? So just a bit of background on Bonhams if you don't know us very well. We were founded in 1793 in London, which makes us one of the um, several Regency auction houses. We are still headquartered in London. We're at 101 New Bond Street in Mayfair, which as the other Amy said, is where I worked for five years before moving to Chicago, which is where I am right now, not that you can tell. <laughs> um, we have 55 specialist departments and a whole range of areas. The images you can see on your screen are just a small selection of things we've sold in the last year or so. Um, a Patek Philippe, the world record for an Aston Martin, a fancy pink diamond, uh, a Leonard Fujita's birthday party, another world record, and um, a bottle of 1926 Macallan, which I'm sure you all have ready for our cocktail hour after this. If you could uh, go ahead, please, Caitlin. Uh, this is just a quick selection of uh, some of our main sale rooms. We do have uh, 65 offices all over the world. Uh, Amy has an office in Boston, as we have in Chicago. Um, and that services about seven main sale rooms. We have two in London, Los Angeles, New York, Hong Kong, Edinburgh, Sydney. And then we do pop-up auctions particularly for our car sales really all over the world. And those, those move around depending upon where the cars are really. Uh, so next, Caitlin. And then just diving into the post-war and contemporary art department a little bit. Um, as Amy said, I'm now our director of international business development. I've previously been a specialist in the field and this is really my area of expertise. Um, we have 20 specialists in eight global locations for Bonham's Contemporary Art Department. We offer over 10 sales a year, in, ranging in price point from $1,000 to $5 million. We really have boutique sales looking at about 50 to 60 items per sale to really give a sort of boutique dedicated service to every single item regardless of price point. And we do see a market leading sell through rate because of that. Again, just a quick selection of my kind of day to day here. Everything from a niche Kapoor disc, a Keith Haring tarp, um, a set of Supreme skateboards, kind of you name it, we've got it for you. So next, Caitlin. So today I just wanted to talk uh, quickly on two kind of key market concepts, which I think are helpful if you're just starting out and then also have really come to the fore lately. Um, I'm then gonna touch on a few collecting areas that we've seen a lot of growth and interest with hopefully more to come and uh, also touch on how COVID has affected the art market and hopefully some silver linings from COVID too because we all need some good news right now. So on this particular slide, I'm going to talk about the primary versus the secondary market. You see Mark Bradford sitting on your left, um, and then a work by Mark Bradford selling with us in London on your right. You might be familiar with Bradford because he represented the US at the Venice Biennale in 2017. Uh, the primary market means buying from the artists themselves. 
And that could be the artist if they're still alive, like Mark Bradford, or their estate if they're deceased. That transaction and that connection. Um, at the primary market, that can really present opportunities, especially to connect with younger artists who are really just starting out in their careers. Um, and you might not even go through a gallery if you're really working with a very young artist where, for instance, you might buy from their graduation show or something like that. Um, all of these transactions with limited exceptions will be private sale transactions, which is something that um, we'll talk about in a second. Great question about when artists die. It's not really the case, but I'll get to it at the end. <laughs> um, then the secondary market, which is what we at Bonhams handle almost exclusively, um, that's buying a work that's been sold before. And you do that via either a gallery, like a major international gallery or an auction house like Bonhams. As I said, that's we really only deal with secondary market transactions. Um, there's pros and cons of both buying types, and I would say our clients almost always use both, but you can, of course, be dedicated to those primary market transactions really with those artists or working on the secondary. Um, some pros and cons of each. Uh, obviously, the primary market, you get to really build those connections with the artists, but on the secondary market, because we're kind of filtering some of what comes to the market. You're therefore having access to things that are a bit better established, have more auction records, have infrastructure like artist studios, foundations, estates, things that kind of give you a bit more market understanding and quite frankly, data points um, when purchasing, which is always nice, particularly if you're coming at this from a kind of investment perspective. So next slide, please, Caitlin. So then private sale versus auction, which I think is uh, a question that collectors and advisors have been asking themselves for really the last decade, but in earnest the last five years. And it's something that has really come to the forefront in COVID. Uh, this slide just shows a scene of one of the many major art fairs. Full disclosure, I cannot remember which one it is. They tend to all look the same inside the tent. And then a scene from our recent sale um, of post-born contemporary art in New York last spring. Um, Bonhams, like all auction houses, especially big ones, um, offers both transaction types. And um, there are really pros and cons as a designer and as a buyer of both, which I'm hopefully going to quickly go through now. Um, a private sale transaction is what it sells like. It's a private transaction between a buyer and a seller with either a gallery or an auction house serving as the intermediary. Um, it's very much more of a retail model, set price, all in commission. Um, just uh, you kind of walk in and that's the price you pay. There can be negotiating involved, but it's kind of like going with a handbag. Um, a pro of this is that it can take place for like any time, even outside of the conventional auction seasons uh, that most houses prescribe to though, but they are again <laughs> sort of changing at the moment. Um, and a benefit for a buyer is that you're not in competition with someone sort of bidding across the sale room. And um, there's also discretion in these transactions if that's something of importance to you. Um, as they don't appear on market databases or in the press, that kind of thing. There is typically a threshold though for um, companies to deal with private sales and that's typically over the $100,000 mark though. That is also changing in the times of COVID. Auction sales, again, exactly as they sound like, someone bidding in the room or over the phone or on the internet this is now exclusively the case. Um, and a benefit of this as a consigner is there is absolutely no limit where the bidding can lead. Uh, you'll see some examples later on, something consigned for $30,000 can sell for $500,000, which is not a chance you would get in a private sale scenario. Um, as a buyer, you know, you are competing with other people, which you might not like very much, but if you are looking for some kind of market confidence, there is something to be 
said about someone else willing to pay $100,000 for the thing you're also bidding on, which some people really like and really appreciate. Um, the buyer's premium, so the auction house's commission, is fixed and cannot be negotiated, um, which makes it also a level playing field and a little bit more transparent than a private sale transaction allows for. Um, it will appear on auction aggregators and uh, market databases, which may not be something you like, but especially if you're looking for a long-term view, that kind of thing to help with provenance and research or possibly people inheriting your collection, I would actually say that's a good thing. Um, next, please, Caitlin. So just some quick collecting insights. Uh, the next few slides, I'll talk you through some collecting areas that are starting to be of increased interest. Um, I appreciate there are some very large numbers here, but all of these categories continue to represent large collecting opportunities across various media, price points, and time periods. Um, I wish I had a crystal ball, like I'm sure all of you do for your areas of business, but these are areas where we continue to anticipate growth and global interest in the coming years. Touching wood as I say that. Um, when we're looking at developing markets, um, there's kind of two big things we look for. One is increased global activity in terms of the buying base. So moving beyond the kind of local area of those artists and makers and then also looking at previously under recognized particularly post-war artists and movements and frequently those two things can go hand in hand uh, the first couple slides focus more on that kind of globalization and then the last two slides look more at that kind of under recognition factor um, so here looking at modern and contemporary african art for which bonhams has a dedicated department and sales of both modern and contemporary African art and specifically South African art. This is a work by the artist L. Anatsui. Uh, it actually sold in a post-war art sale that I was involved in. On a personal level, this is probably my favorite work we've ever sold. It's actually um, recycled bottle cans, bottle tops and cans that are all woven together to create basically what feels like fabric. Um, and this is an early work when it was genuine recycling before he was getting the elements manufactured for his art. Um, so this is the kind of thing that's very contemporary and aesthetic and look and feel um, from this particular category. But if you go to the next slide, Caitlin, this is a Benjamin and Juan Wu work for which Bonhams holds the world record, which shows that much more kind of figurative, traditional, more kind of post-war aesthetic that also is evident in this kind of collecting field. And I would say we've seen a real increase in global buyers looking to buy into this, whether it's at this kind of seven figure level or at the kind of 5,000 pound level, which we also offer. And we've actually expanded our sale offerings and included a sale now in New York versus just London for these, which I think speaks to that increased globalization. Caitlin, if you could go to the next slide. Um, then contemporary Middle Eastern art, which I am very much not a specialist in, so um, I can't go too, too deep into it. But again, another field where you're seeing both a more diverse buying base looking at them and then the infrastructure necessary to bring these categories into the mainstream. Things like, you know, research facilities, um, catalog resumes, uh, even just well-established estates, that kind of thing that give a market momentum and longevity, which is very important when you're buying. Um, this is a great example of an artist, Mahmoud Saeed, that we sold um, in London a few years ago. So next slide, that's a painting. Um, so moving on to female artists, which I appreciate is about as broad as it can get <laughs> for a collecting category, um, but it does cover really any aesthetic or time period that you are interested in and that would fit in your collection. Um, I'm using a work by Ruth Asawa here um, as an example of that. They just announced a great postage stamp featuring her and a major biography on her has just been released. So good timing all around. Um, 
whilst there's been a huge amount of growth for female artist markets in the last decade, I mean, Ruth Asawa here springs to mind, Joan Mitchell springs to mind as an example, it's still fair to say that dollar for dollar, they are undervalued relative to their male counterparts, which quite frankly, if you're looking for opportunities, that's a good one to look for. Um, and again, there's so many different aesthetics or things you can look at really based on whatever niche you wanna fill in your collection or in your home. So then just the next slide, Caitlin. Then lastly, um, hard edge abstraction, but especially abstraction in general. Um, abstract art is obviously a hugely well-established blue chip movement. Um, abstract expressionism like Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko is arguably the most valuable category in the market, easily selling in the eight figure plus range, if you can even buy it at all, because for the most part, those works are now not really available. And because of that, the market continues to explore movements that capture that kind of post-war experimentation and that post-war aesthetic, but haven't reached that kind of level of being unattainable or just quite frankly, unavailable. Uh, we've seen examples of this happen really across movements, but um, the post-war British Taiwanese artist, Richard Lin is a great example. Uh, second wave abstract expressionist is another great example, but here I'm specifically talking about West Coast hard edge painters. Um, technically, Billy Al Bankston is not a hard edge painter, but you can lump him in with everyone, and I think you'll forgive me on that. And he fits well with artists like Carl Benjamin, Frederick Hammersley, Laura Sorf Battleston, and John McLaughlin, who honestly were effectively ignored since having um, some coverage of them at museums in the 50s and 60s. And you're now seeing a huge amount of interest in people looking to um, buy into this kind of field. And as someone has just said, the estimate versus what it's sold for. I was in the room for this in LA in February, which is crazy to think that I was on a plane <laughs> at that time. But um, we, there was, I think, 15 bidders competing for this work. Um, and it, the bidding lasted 10 minutes. And just seeing people really hungry to, to acquire these works while they can is is really remarkable and we are building an exhibition about this kind of movement um, for early next year which we're excited about so next slide please caitlin moving on to covid19 the um unavoidable elephant in the room um i don't want to dwell too much over it as it's obviously you know everything we hear about all day but i did want to discuss a few silver linings that have come from it just to bring a bit of good news. Um, here I've included a work by the, the infamous street artist Banksy, um, which was recently displayed at a hospital in Southampton in the UK, which is working hard along with so many of our um, health care providers to fight the pandemic. It um, appeared overnight, um, though there is far more choreography involved in these Banksy stunts than I think they make it appear. And I'm sure with the current restrictions, it was heavily choreographed. But this work, after being displayed in the waiting room in the hospital for a few months, will be auctioned in the fall. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it shows a little boy who's, you know, ignoring his Batman to play with a nurse as his hero doll, which is pretty, a nice message at the moment. So looking at the changes brought by COVID, I think it's undeniable the dominance of online interfaces and the importance of them. Um, we've seen a truly staggering amount of online activity in our sales, with some sales seeing a sort of 50% increase in online bidders. Um, we are now staging a lot of our sales either online only or through hybrid sale models, which means that someone can be on the phone with me in Chicago and I can relay that bid to our auctioneer in London um, to allow people to bid either online or through a kind of pseudo online environment. Um, you've seen a huge amount of confidence in people being willing to 
by online, including at the seven figure level and across art and jewelry and other media. And I think that will undoubtedly stay in a kind of post COVID world. Um, for consigners, I think at the moment, if someone was looking to consign an item, they might be naturally worried about that. Um, but honestly, the demand for buying right now has gone from strength to strength. I speak to clients all the time who are just so hungry to see things and look at things and, you know, as kind of perverse as it sounds to use this extra time they have at home to, to build and to expand their collections. And then for a collector, especially a new collector, um, you know, a sad outcome of COVID may be increased distress sales um, later on in the year if you are looking for buying opportunities. Um, so that's everything for me. I'll let Catherine and Amy, the other Amy, take back over for questions. I think I saw some coming in on the chat. So if I missed anything, please let me know. I, can, I, can I ask a question, Amy? I have like maybe a rudimentary question that's a little off base, but. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I um, right. like Mike, I guess what I'm wondering is like, if I'm a, if I'm someone who's interested in, you know, buying contemporary African art or mm -hmm. I'm interested in a particular artist or I'm interested in Hudson River Valley art like I have some, like I'm a particular interest in some field or some person like how do I know when things become available for that person like I, I I feel like I've talked to clients before who have a particular interest in something sure. and there's no and like they're not aware of a way to identify when whatever that thing is becomes available and and I, I guess I'm just wondering like are we missing something is there some tool out there to do that or or is there not there's a few options out there and I would recommend a combination of several the first is befriending your friendly local art specialist especially in whatever field they're interested in so if it was contemporary art someone like me or African art a specialist in that particular field mm -hmm. and actually as our lead business development person that's what i do basically all day long is you know taking those comments when someone has said to me you know like i love oh like pink warhol queen's print yeah. and when we find one letting them know that the other is um there's various databases like artnet that you can register for alerts mm -hmm. Um, that will then notify you across houses and possibly include maybe smaller houses that you don't necessarily have a connection with. Okay, cool. That's helpful. Of course. Amy, would you run any of the aggregator sites for that? Can that be helpful in the same way? In yeah, so Artnet is a kind of pseudo aggregate auctioneer slash database. Um, there's also other aggregators like Invaluable and Artsy that allow you to kind of have one account that you bid through. Uh, there are some bidding limits and that kind of thing on them, but at at least a kind of research identification level, those can be very helpful as well. Mm. Great. Question from Hammond. Uh, Amy, great presentation, I enjoyed it. Uh, what, what are you seeing in terms of the resaleability of old masters? you see movement there? Do you, are they stale? What do, you, what do you see? So I'm very much not an old master specialist, so please take anything I'm about to say with a pinch of salt. But <laughs> um, there's a few things. Um, and the first is really across the market as a whole, which is despite kind of COVID or recessions or political turmoil or the markets. What's been really the case since the last recession is that clients are looking for the utmost quality with great provenance and great condition. So if you have something that's been in a family for a really long time, has been well cared for, and is a great example of that artist, it's a less thought after time period, like old masters has kind of become that in the last, you know, 20 to 30 years. 
those things are still selling incredibly cool. well. And, you know, if, if you take care of your things and you've got something great to begin with, that is kind of the, the good news story here. In terms of the kind of larger market, it's obviously cooled off. Unfortunately, you know, the rise of contemporary, as is my department, I think has changed taste in a lot of ways, but you are seeing a kind of change in interior design aesthetic that is kind of people wanting to be much more kind of diverse in the look and feel of their homes that isn't necessarily entirely sleek and modern. And especially we have sales in the UK of lower value old masters, but a huge amount of our buyers there who've inherited or recently bought kind of large country piles in the UK and want to fill them with kind of interesting but you know maybe not necessarily wildly valuable old masters but also include that with their contemporary art and their modern design pieces and create a kind of more kind of textured aesthetic sure. if you will. Mix it up more diverse collection. Amy who's what's the demographic Traffic of the buyers for the old masters? Oh, again, not my area, but um, I would say it is a little more European focused. Though, again, if it's quality and if it's good, you are seeing Chinese bidding, absolutely. Um, I would say, especially in the last 10 years or so, you've kind of seen Russian activity drop off basically completely. Um, but to my knowledge, it's largely European with some American and also Chinese, especially at a high quality level. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So, um, in honor of the Timberland, we are having, um, the, the bourbon because that's what they drink in the Timberland world. And Amy, what do they drink in the contemporary art world? Um, well, I guess as Bonhams and we're British, we drink gin, but this is water. So I can go for a run after this. Cheers. Cheers. You're doing Woodford Reserve? I am. And it turns out Joe also has the Woodford Reserve too, so. And I just we all missed our mint juleps at the beginning of the month. Just saying. I know. I had this big party. I, I planned for the uh, Kentucky Derby next year. Uh, Amy, can I ask you, um, so what, I'm trying to think how I would phrase this question. If you look at your buyer profile, um, and, and I, I understand there's, there's a range on that, but how many what percentage are looking at just your investment? And then at the other end of the spectrum, how, what percentage are really like, I just went bonkers and don't care about the money. And then maybe there's something in between there of, of people who are like, I'm kind of into the investment. I'm kind of into the passion. I think the kind of both is the vast majority. I mean, most people don't want to lose money. <laughs> um, how, willing people are to speak about investment in art is something that has changed a lot, but I think is, is something that people don't necessarily talk about still, but you are seeing a, you know, with the rise of the art storage unit, particularly the tax-free storage unit, that's obviously changed people's buying because if you're not willing to hang it in your house, kind of why are you buying it um and we are seeing kind of the advent not really even the advent anymore but the consistent buying by art funds and and other things like that that are exclusively looking at this for investment but i think there remains a kind of collecting drive to almost all of our transactions still Okay. And so, what kind of people are invest in Timberland? Mm -hmm. Like, do they just own it from when they were born, oh. or do people actually buy Timberland for investments? Well, both. I mean, I guess to 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 sort of you know uh, collaborate here. One of 
I have seen the finest collections of a private American art is owned by a family that owns about 600,000 acres of timberland in Alabama and a couple uh, mills. Um, uh, speaking of women, uh, the, the Timberlands was originally a, a short pulpwood company um, that uh, there was, the, the founder had only a daughter and she took over the company and said, we need to buy Timberlands in order to stay sustainable. And that was around the turn of the last century. Say uh, they started in 1880 and um, um, she came along in say 1920 and started purchasing this land. Uh, they now really have no manufacturing assets. They have, you know, probably a $2 billion portfolio of Timberland and eh, a billion and a half. Uh, but, you know, Amy sort of nodded her head. She probably knows who it is. Uh, it's the Jack. So then, so Mrs. Warner, she became, it's the Westervelt company and Mrs. This is Warner, uh, married into uh, and so now the owners are all Warners. Uh, her grandson, Jack Warner, started collecting um, and famously actually got in a, a dispute in 2012 with his son, uh, John Warner, um, over a $43 million uh, painting that he claimed was, the son claimed was purchased with, um, with company assets and the father claimed it was private. So he sued his father. Uh, apparently very amicably. The company took the painting, auctioned it for $43.5 million, and built a pellet mill in southern Alabama with that. So uh, so that's that's some of the people who own Timberland, but I, I didn't mean to get on that, uh, that uh, go down that rabbit hole, but since I think we've moved to the cocktail portion of the hour, let's go with it. Uh, I asked Amy the question because Typically, when we look at, at the non-institutional, like the private high net worth type that's buying timberland, uh, she or he oftentimes, more often than not, it is strictly investment driven mm -hmm. and, and there's very little passion. When we get to the retail end, which is the sort of 400,000 to million and a half dollar level, you get some people who say, hey, I live in Boston, I live in New York, I live in Dallas, and I'm looking for something that I can hunt on on the weekends or canoe on or snowshoe or whatever your gig is. Uh, but I want it to, to pay, you know, to have some investment characteristics. So they'll, they'll bid a lower discount rate, especially essentially pay a, a small premium to what the straight investor would, but they always want money back. And, and I asked the question of Amy, because there have been times where we've been negotiating a 20, 30, 40, hundred million dollar transaction privately with a high net worth individual and and he or she will be saying like no 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 the cash flows don't look good like i'm worried about markets i need a seven percent return like i i, I don't care like this is not going to work and then three weeks later here in the wall street or in the wall street journal or the new york times like they went out and purchased you know a, 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 a whatever you know because then there's an interview and they're like I was so moved because my aunt used to live in Brooklyn and this artist grew up in the projects and I just, their highest work sold for $5 million before, but I paid 50 so for this one. This I'm like, you know. The beauty of auction that I, you know, as I said, in private sale versus auction, it, it's been a kind of trend that people say like, oh, I, I only want to buy or sell privately. But if, especially at a sell level, that's where people just get swept away and there is that theater of auction and we see it all the time of people just it's something that they want but you know it is still a long-term game and it's something that they would definitely most likely be giving to their children after their death and that does kind of create a slightly different approach than we're looking for it to be a kind of five to 10 year turnaround. Okay. And Amy, like on that, um, on the exact topic of sort of inheritance, what's, what's yours and Bonham's experience lately with, with estate tax returns and art and the, you know, the art, advisory panel at the IRS like is there any like do you have a set I, I was like I've, I've filed estate tax returns for lots of estates where 
there's been a significant portion of art and I'm always curious to see sort of what the trends are uh, with the art advisory panel at the IRS. I don't know if you have any insight into that and how closely they're looking at these things or challenging valuations. Amy Corcoran, feel yeah. free to so, jump in here. Um, you know, we, we do have our appraisals challenged from time to time, um, but when you get sort of a overall report from the IRS, it's always a couple of years lag time. You yeah. Know, get the data, so it's t difficult to say. Um, one interesting question around that, though, that we've been discussing internally to a great extent is how do we value things this spring? And I think that, that a lot of estate planners were expecting that um, we would see much lower valuations this spring. And uh, I even had an estate that took an alternate valuation date um, in March because wow. they felt that they that would pay a much lower tax bill. But honestly, we're not seeing the prices have uh, declined. So we're, we really aren't going to be lowering our uh, appraised values from October to March. Um, there was, uh, I think it was Sotheby's had a sale this week in modern and contemporary and the prices were as high as ever. Um, mm -hmm. Our sales are coming up in two weeks and that will be very telling for Amy's category and, and Impressionist and Modern, but we're, we're not seeing a significant discount at the moment. That's been what we're seeing on the real estate side. And Craig, I was thinking about the project we were alluding to earlier, and we had a brief yeah. kick around, I think earlier this week on why we should take another look at that rent in the context of the current environment. And we concluded mm -hmm. that we didn't know the rent might actually be higher because there's, this was a, this was an intrafamilial rent calculation for a, for a, for a vineyard property. Um, and we thought, well, geez, maybe rent would be lower, but the truth is it could be higher because of the number of people trying to bid to get off, you know, get off and get to the island. So it's, um, there's a lot of assuming going on. I've had a number of like PE guys that I've sold houses to over the years, you know, and stayed in touch with a guy just got in touch with me saying, oh, you know, I've always wanted to buy a place in Vermont. And if you see opportunistic windows and I'm like laughing, <laughs> like you and every other private equity guy who's trying to make something happen in Vermont. There was um, two weeks ago, there was a bidding war over a property that had been sitting on the market and traded for a little silly number because three of them got going on it and it went from, it went from offer to close in 36 hours. So it's a funny market out there and it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of wealth and that group hasn't felt the pain at all, really. Unless they're in the oil and gas. The only gas pain they felt is to get away from the cities. You got it. Exactly. They're willing to pay to get out of there. Yeah. And you're seeing that in Weston too, right, Catherine? Yes. Our market is definitely, um, we don't have any, like hardly any inventory, Weston and Wellesley. And um, people are, uh, funny, families here. Um, this is something... I think you all know I came from California. California, nobody moves. Like when their kids like graduate from high school, they don't sell their house to go move. There's no way to move, they stay. Over here, when their kids graduate, they move to the Cape or Florida or wherever. And so now all of these people that I have met along the way since I've been here who've moved are now all wanting to move back. So I would, I don't know. Like, I think you should have, keep your family home. Oh, well, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're missing the key that. thing, which is that California is like a really nice place to live all the time. And right. we're all just trying to get out of the weather. <laughs> yeah. Joe, this is Matt. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, timber is such an interesting asset class. So I've always been fascinated with it. Not a lot of analysts really cover it, except maybe like GMO in Boston always has a thing on timber and they've always thought it highly of that asset class. But it's really hard to keep track of. I know um, my firm, Northern Trust, U.S. Trust, a few firms do manage timber, direct timber holdings. But for most clients that don't want to walk the property and own, you know, $10 million worth of timberland, they're going to typically be investing through public companies or ETFs, things like that. And, you know, it's just not the same um, exposure. It's not the same um, uh, you know, you can't just say your, tim your, your, your investment is growing 5% a year. Um, there's like a mixture of pulp mills and this and that and real estate developers in there. You know, what, what do you do for um, clients who want to have a timber exposure, but maybe 
don't want to necessarily walk the property right away and get a feel for it. It's tough. Okay. I mean, like it, it, there's a band that it becomes very tough with, uh, and that's the sort of, I mean, look, if you want to invest a half million dollars and you, you want to actually visit it as well, it, it, that's actually, I don't want to say easy, but you can buy the place in Vermont or, or if you're, you know, in Atlanta, you could buy something, you know, in Albany or Macon or Thomasville or whatever, you know, and, and just have it and you have them sort of forced to look after it and, and it's good. Um, if you've got $50 million, you can either do something big direct or go to a, a separate account structure with one of the Timberland Investment Management Organizations. Uh, and 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 you know really have discretion over the funds. Uh, that sort of seven hundred fifty thousand to one and a half two million becomes tough because um, you know you, you kind of have to be a somewhat hands on manager, um, but it's not throwing off you know a ton of cash. Like if you have fifty million dollar property, you know you, you've got significant cash flow to, to underwrite your operations. But you know for a million and a half dollars, you don't. Uh, so, you know, obviously U.S. Trust offers uh, that product, um, that sort of placement service and management service. Uh, you know, the equity investment side is really challenging because, um, and so really there, so quick fact, like in 1997, there were 56 and a half million acres owned by publicly traded C-Corps. Now there's a half million acres owned by publicly traded C-Corps. It all transitioned over into the, the Timberland Investment Management Organizations, or you had you know, the bigger groups convert to REITs, Rainier, Potlatch, Deltic, Warehouser, Plum Creek acquired by Warehouser, Deltic acquired by Potlatch, uh, and then Catchmark Timber Trust. Um, the REITs are better, especially a pure timber REIT, uh, like Rainier, or, um, and look, I'm, I'm not a stock picker here. I'm not saying these are good investments by any stretch. I'm just saying in terms of having direct exposure to timberland and, and you know, those market cycles, you would pick one that didn't have, uh, you know, a manufacturing component like Warehouse or, or former Plum Creek or Potlatch. Uh, but still, the, the publicly traded REITs or, or, or C-Corps they manage um, they manage to quarterly earnings, okay? And we see it working on the inside. Very good companies doing good things. I'm not saying they're bad people. Just you see that their behaviors are influenced by quarterly return, whether or not they're going to produce a good saw timber tree in 18 years, right? They think about 18 months or 18 days. Uh, so that's what makes the publicly traded side a little more challenging. Um, I tell people to buy direct, like go out and find a good forester. There are a lot of groups like Landvest. I tell you that we manage two and a half million acres. We manage properties that are 400 acres. Okay. And there are a lot of good firms out there. American Forest Management, Larson McGowan in the South, uh, you know, Steigerwald Land Services. You, you can look through the Association of Consulting Foresters. There's any number of good people out there that would help you to buy a, a timberland property, 400 acres, and they can manage it, and you don't even ever have to invest uh, visit it. Yeah, okay? that's helpful. Thank you. I mean, one of the concerns that I've had with small investors wanting to have direct investments is they're not able to diversify their holdings enough to avoid, like you said earlier, the insects infestation or a hurricane comes in or what have you. And it's like too much risk in one geography sometimes. Um, do you guys offer or do you know a way to pool investors together, like maybe a bunch of smaller investors in a, in a, like a limited partnership structure to go out and get participation in, in, a, in a diversified portfolio? So, you know, that's what we would call uh, uh, the friends and family. And, and those, those groups do exist, okay? Um, and typically it would be, they're they're limited, okay? They're they're typically an MLP structure, and it's someone you know. It'd be like this is not my goal in life, but Taggart leaves Landvest because four people who each had ten million dollars said we want you to set up a fund. Those go well. They get four more friends that each have one to three million dollars, and we set up you know three or four different MLPs and operate them. 
and pool together 40, 50 million, $100, $100 million over a period of time. Uh, so we're familiar with those groups. Uh, actually, Lime Timber, which is now a very successful TMO, started out in 1979 as a friends and family type operation, and they were really good operators and, 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 and good investors and, and did a good job uh, and grew into what they are. So, you know, I could put you in touch with some. There aren't a lot of them, uh, but they exist. There aren't any more questions. I just wanted to remind everyone that this is the first of uh, our series of four presentations. So uh, the next three Wednesdays, we will hold similar discussions with a uh, uh, real estate component from Landvest and um, three different specialists from Bonhams, uh, giving you a little peek into their uh, segment of the market. So we have jewelry and then I believe Asian art and motor cars and, and Catherine, what? Um, we have um, divesting um, multifamily assets, which is a huge thing for all of the people who are here. Uh, someone passes away, and then we have to deal with their land. And how do you divest it properly and equitably? So that's what we're going to be talking about next week. The week after that, we're going to be talking about opportunity zones. And then the third week, we're, I mean, the final week, we'll be talking about luxury real estate investment in luxury real estate, and then just living in luxury real estate. So I think it's gonna be really great, and I think everyone's gonna really enjoy it. And would really appreciate, uh, if you liked it, to spread the word to everybody. Um, I think there was an accident with our invitations this evening, unfortunately, because um, as Jay said, some people got a cancellation notice um, but the good news is we are recording this, so we will be able to send it out to everybody who uh, was interested in attending. So those people will have that. Uh, so uh, anyway. I think there was one more question that came in. Let's I'm so sorry. I, I'm a laggard here. I just, any thoughts on Lucio Fontana? Probably from Amy. Yeah, let me un unmute myself. Yeah, uh, Lucio Fontana is uh, Argentine born, but really known as an Italian artist. He was born in 1896, I think, and died in the late 1960s. He is best known for canvases that have a slash or single, a slash or multiple slashes in them in various colors, his Concetto Spaziale series. Um, he is definitively blue chip, I would say. Um, you know, good museum holding. If you want a red Concetto Spaziale canvas in a kind of nice size, like 100 by 80 centimeters, you're looking like seven-ish million at the moment. So it's that kind of asset level. He also did um, sculpture and ceramics, which are a much kind of more attainable price point. We actually sell his ceramics really regularly in our London auctions. Uh, that's something that you are looking at the kind of like 50,000 pound range. Um, he also did like major, more serious sculpture, that kind of thing. Was there a specific question you had or you were just curious about him? Well, I just, in, in full disclosure, my firm lends against art. And sure. I've, seen, I've seen his name floating around on a couple of things that we were looking at. So I was just curious, as, and you answered my question when you said definitively blue chip. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the Italian art market was very hot in sort of 2014, 2015. It has cooled a little bit, but again, just as I said earlier, if it's fresh to market, so like hasn't been chopped around, hasn't been through auction recently, if the condition is good, which for Fontana condition is like the most important thing when okay. it's literally just like a canvas with a slash in it, if there's any kind of mark on it, you're gonna see it. So if you guys are looking at lending against something, make sure you have a watertight condition report would be my advice. Um, 
And, but if it's great condition, really fresh to market, there's still a lot of interest there. And um, for particularly the slash works, the Oteze works, um, black, red, or white are the three most sought after colors. Great, that is very helpful. Really. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> And hey, if that uh, loan defaults, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be giving you, we'll give you a holler. Uh, yeah, we'll let you know. Well, thank you, everybody. That was super fun. Um, and we're going to be 